All right, so we're going to begin a study of the, uh, the book of Ephesians. In your handout, uh, one of the things that uh, I mention about this uh, epistle, uh, it has been called the queen of the epistles because of the, uh, the very lofty ideas contained in chapter one and also because it deals with the church as a spiritual entity rather than a physical, rather than a physical one. The book of Acts talks a lot about the church, the where and when and how of the church, the movement of the missionaries, you know, how to do things, what they did, where they went, how many people were baptized, so on and so forth. The physical establishment of the church. Uh, but the book of Ephesians uh, talks about the church in spiritual, uh, in spiritual tones. Uh, we have several objections, uh, not objections, but objectives. Uh, hope, I hope they're not any objectives, uh, objections, but objectives. Uh, the first one is to become familiar with the teachings that are contained in this particular uh, uh, epistle. You might not think of it, but the plan of salvation, if you were in the class on Christian doctrine, remember we talked about the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation is really talked about in the book of Ephesians. The plan of salvation from God's perspective is discussed at length here, so that's one of the advantages of studying this epistle. Another objective is that you have a greater appreciation for the church and its centrality in God's purpose for man. Uh, it seems to be the style today, the, the, the fad today, the, the thinking that, well, we really don't need the church. There's some sort of bias against organized religion. Uh, the younger generation seems to be rejecting uh, religious bodies that are organized. Uh, they say, well, you know, I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. I don't know how you could do that, but I don't know how you can eliminate religion. Structure, God is a God of structure. Just take a look at what He's created and you'll see that God is a God of structure. So if the God who structured this entire universe um, doesn't structure the church, doesn't make any sense, doesn't it? So hopefully this book will, or this epistle will raise your appreciation for God's view and God's purpose for the body called the church. And then thirdly, that you become sensitized to the great difference between the physical realm and the spiritual realm in which you live simultaneously as Christians. The great problem with Christianity or the great challenge of Christianity is that we live in two worlds at the same time. It's that constant dichotomy. Two things, two pressures on us all the time. We live in a spiritual realm, but we also live in a physical realm, and we do both at the same time. And the book of Ephesians helps us with that, with that struggle. Hopefully by the end of the class, I hope that you'll have a clearer view of God, a clearer view of His church, and the very real blessings and the power that we have as Christians. All right, so we know that Paul is the author of this epistle and wrote it as a result of his visits to this place, Ephesus. And before we actually begin the text, I thought it would be helpful if we, if we briefly reviewed Paul's ministry, since much of it is interwoven with the work that he did in this area. And the handouts that you have will help you kind of follow that chronologically. We don't have a lot of information about Paul before he became an apostle, from his birth to around 31 AD, his early life in Tarsus and Jerusalem. We know that he traced his lineage to the tribe of Benjamin. He was born in Tarsus as a Roman citizen. Interesting thing about Tarsus, when the Romans took over, there was a choice. If, if, you, if you fight us, we'll come in and you know, we'll, do what, we'll do to you what we did to every other city, every other province, every other area. But if you cooperate with us, we'll give you Roman citizenship. 
And so Paul was born in a city and born as a Roman citizen for that quirk of history, if you wish. Acts chapter 16. Tarsus was a city of learning, and this is where Paul became acquainted with Greek learning and language, as well as various religious cults. Uh, he received his formal education at the feet of Gamaliel, a great Jewish teacher in Jerusalem. Again, uh, the Bible talks about that in Acts chapter 7 and Galatians chapter 1 verse 13. As a young man he was given authority to direct the persecution of the Christians as a member of the local synagogue or Sanhedrin or council if you wish. He cast his vote against Christians in order to imprison or execute them. Talk about that in Acts chapter 26. Uh, we think that uh, his family was of some prominence in Jerusalem since we see that when he himself was imprisoned, he sent his nephew directly to the Roman leaders to inform them of a plot. And this uh, may not have been possible without a certain position of influence in that society of that time. Uh, we don't have a whole lot other information about his early years other than that he was probably, and there's debate about this, nothing in the Bible, again speculation, probably a widower, since he encourages the unmarried, and when you use the term unmarried, you're talking about widows, widowers, divorced, that, that term covered that group of people. If you were talking about people who had never married, you talked about virgins. Virgins were people who had never married. So he talks about the unmarried at Corinth to remain as he was, unmarried, 1 Corinthians 7, for the sake of peace in times of persecution. And one of the arguments for this theory is that uh, uh, he refers to himself as such, and you had to be married in order to be on the council in the synagogue or in the Sanhedrin. If you were not married, you, you were not allowed to be part of that. Um, either way, uh, it changes nothing about his doctrine or teaching, just some historical speculation. We know very little of his looks. 1 Corinthians 2, 2 Corinthians 10 suggest that his physical appearance was not impressive. Some non-biblical but historical writings, the Acts of Paul, for example, or the book of Thela, say that he was short and balding. That's why he's my favorite apostle. <laughs> he had crooked legs, he was bow-legged, uh, but had a healthy body, bushy eyebrows that joined, he had a hooked nose. In other words, he looked like a Jewish person. You know, we always, uh, all the Hollywood images of the apostles, you know, these tall guys, you know, 5'11", 6'1", you know, with dark brown hair, that, are you kidding me? <laughs> if you're over six foot, you were a giant in those days. So he was a Jewish looking man, small, dark complexion. They also write that despite his humble physical appearance, he was full of grace and sometimes had the face of an angel. Again, non-biblical writing, historical writing. Uh, from 32 to 34 AD in that period, his conversion and early ministry, of course, most of our knowledge of him begins with his conversion on the road to Damascus, very familiar story. He had received official orders to go there and arrest Christians, Acts 9. He was acquainted with Christianity and Christians, but as a persecutor. He was there when Stephen was martyred, Acts 7, when the church was being persecuted, Acts 8. On his way to Damascus, he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. I want to read Acts, as I say, we're not going to read all of these you know, passages here, we don't have the time. It says, and it came about that as he journeyed, he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city and it shall be told you what you must do. And the men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus and he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. So he fasted and prayed for three days. That's what a Jew would do 
a pious Jew, and was sent um, to him uh, by the Lord, uh, or a man named Ananias was sent to him by the Lord to teach him the nature of his ministry, which, he would, uh, which would be to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, Acts chapter nine. So after his conversion and healing, he began his ministry preaching to the Jews in Damascus, and he was quite successful at this. During this period, he also spent time in the desert, devoting himself to prayer and study, Galatians chapter one. And eventually, he had to escape from Damascus because of the pressure he was receiving from Jews. He was not very popular among the Jews. He was the leader of the, the persecutors, and now he becomes a defender of the persecuted. So he was not popular with the Jews. Uh, in 35 AD, he tries to associate with the apostles, after his escape from Damascus, he returns to Jerusalem, tries to associate with the apostles and be recognized by them in Acts 9. They were skeptical at first, which would be normal, uh, but with Barnabas' reference and commendation of his conversion and work, he was accepted by them and began to teach and preach. And, and doesn't that sound familiar even to this day? You know, a, a preacher comes, you, you hire a preacher, you hire an associate minister, whatever it is, you hire a youth minister, someone to work in the church, and, and they can have a degree, and they can have this and that, but in my experience, when the elders are looking, you know, they are looking through the person's background, where he worked, the key uh, a document that they're looking for are letters of recommendation from other elders and, and other churches vouching for the stability of this individual as a minister and as a Christian and so on and so forth. Nothing has changed. In the same way, Barnabas provides uh, that word of approval uh, so that he can be accepted. Uh, again, he's threatened and has to escape and um, uh, leaves for a time. Next slide, in 36 to 42 AD, he is returned to Tarsus. Six years. So after he leaves Jerusalem, he returns to his hometown of Tarsus, spends several years preaching and teaching there. Some scholars call this the silent period of his ministry. Six years, not six months, six years. And then 42 to 44 AD, teaches at Antioch. The church at Antioch was the first to have a mixture of Jewish and non-Jewish Christians, having been formed as uh, Christians were escaping the persecution in Jerusalem, they formed a church uh, in Antioch. So this created some strain, this was a new mixture, Jews and, and Gentiles together under one head, one religion. And so Barnabas recruits Paul to come with him to teach and preach at this place because of his understanding of Gentile customs, Greek thinking and so on and so forth, and the fact that he is a Jew, well trained in the scriptures, the perfect match for this particular church. 44 AD, he helps with the collection for Jerusalem. About this time, Jerusalem and the surrounding area suffered famine conditions. A collection is taken up to help out, and Barnabas and Saul were put in charge of bringing it to Jerusalem for distribution, Acts chapter 11. I want you to notice it's a long time between the time that you know, he sees Jesus and Jesus gives him his ministry and he actually starts that ministry. There's a long period of training, a long period of development there before he actually begins his ministry. 45 AD, by 45 AD we are into the missionary journeys. Most of the last half of the book of Acts describe Paul's three missionary journeys, Acts 13, one and following. It's during the second of these journeys that he first visits the city where he will eventually establish a congregation in Acts chapter 18. His three journeys took him on over uh, ever widening loops around the Mediterranean area where he would establish churches on the way out and then revisit and strengthen those churches on the way back to Antioch and Jerusalem. Uh, 58 to 60 AD, his uh, imprisonment at Caesarea. One of Paul's ongoing problems was the attacks of Jewish leaders, jealous of his success, 
and fear that their religion would be defiled or displaced. So on one of his returns to Jerusalem, they create a riot and they cause him to be imprisoned by the Roman authorities. He remains in a Roman jail for two years while local rulers like Felix and Festus and Agrippa hold him captive in order to appease the Jewish leaders. Ultimately, Paul appeals his case to Caesar, which he was allowed to do as a Roman citizen, and was sent to Rome for trial. 60 to 61 AD, his trip to Rome. This trip by ship to Rome was interrupted by a shipwreck and they stayed on the island of Malta. And eventually in the spring of 61 AD, Paul arrives under guard in Rome. Again, read about that in Acts chapter 28. Uh, it was ironic because one of Paul's goals was to go to Rome, the capital of the empire, and preach the gospel. And the Lord assured him that that would happen, but not exactly in the way he thought it would happen. <laughs> and I'm always reminded that isn't that the way it happens in our own lives so many times? We ask God for something and it happens, but not exactly the way we thought it was going to happen. Right? Same, same process here for Paul the Apostle. 61 to 63 AD, Roman house arrest. Luke tells us in Acts 28 that Paul was under a type of house arrest for two years awaiting trial. However, during this time he taught many who visited him, especially the Jewish leaders in Rome, who ultimately rejected him and his teaching anyways. He did, however, have great success with many Gentiles in Rome, including other prisoners and guards in his circle. Uh, Onesimus, uh, Colossians chapter 4, 9, the Praetorian guard we talk about in Philippians 1. While he's in prison, he writes several letters to different churches. We call them the prison epistles. We have from these uh, letters, we have remaining, uh, the Ephesian, the letter to the Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, prison epistles. In 63 AD, he's released from prison. It seems that he won his case when he appears before Caesar because we see Paul visiting other churches after his arrest and imprisonment in Rome the first time. So between 64 and 66 AD, he revisits the churches. Now this period is less clear than his previous activities. There's no biblical evidence, but there are some historical writings, uh, for example, the letter of Clement in 85, 95 rather, AD, says that he did visit Spain, but after his first Roman imprisonment. And from his writings, we do find out that during this time, he revisits established congregation. Well, doesn't it make sense? He's been out of circulation for two years. He writes to these churches. He's concerned about them. His desire when he was in full missionary mode was to just keep pushing the boundaries, to get to Spain. Now, after being out of circulation for two years, his concern is for the churches that have already been established. So from his writings, we find out that he visited several congregations. For example, he spent time in Crete, Titus chapter one, verse three, a large island in the Mediterranean. He went to Ephesus, 1 Timothy 1. He traveled to Corinth, 2 Timothy 4. He stopped at Troas, again, 2 Timothy 4, and he went to Miletus, 2 Timothy 4. So during this brief period of freedom, it's believed that he wrote the first letter to Timothy and also the letter to Titus. 67 AD, Paul is martyred in Rome. In 64 AD, Nero, the emperor, burned down the city of Rome. And to divert blame from himself, he blamed Christians for starting the blaze. They were already unpopular, and so it was easy to begin their persecution. Multitudes of Roman citizens were arrested and put to death during this time. And Paul, as a recognized uh, a leader, religious leader, was also rearrested. You know, they had a record of him, they knew who he was, he was famous, probably the most next to Peter, the most well-known of the apostles, Christian leaders. And it's from his cell awaiting execution that he writes his final letter to Timothy, that would be 2 Timothy, and then he was beheaded soon after. 
and thus ended the life of one of the great servants of the Lord. So there, you know, first lesson on Ephesians, just a very quick overview of the life of Paul who wrote the letter to this particular church. Uh, let's talk about Paul in Ephesus. We have a few minutes left here. Now the story of Paul's visits to Ephesus and the establishment of the church begins in Acts chapter 18. In Acts chapter 18, 18 to 21, Paul is on his second missionary journey on his way home from Athens in Greece. And he visits briefly to an enthusiastic response and leaves Aquila and Priscilla there in order to return home to report on his work. There were no conversions at this time. In Acts chapter 18, let's go to Acts chapter 18. It says, now a certain Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. That's a key idea right there. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he helped greatly those who had believed through grace. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So Apollos, this teacher, comes to Ephesus, remember Paul's already visited once, no conversions. He preaches to the same people that Paul did and we find the results of his preaching in the next chapter. But Luke writes that Paul's friends Aquila and Priscilla take Apollos aside and they teach him more accurately the way of God. Again, only in the next chapter do we get some idea of what Apollos was taught by Aquila and Priscilla. So in Acts chapter 19, Paul returns for a second visit to Ephesus and now he establishes the church. He finds the 12 disciples, believers, who have been taught by Apollos. They were not taught, they were not taught by Paul, they were not taught by Aquila or Priscilla. Uh, that means they had been taught by Apollos. So Paul learns that they have been incorrectly taught and he learns this by asking about their conversion. Again, you know, people say, what do, you, what do you do when someone new comes to the church you know, and you don't know their background and, you know, and, and they, they would like to be part of the church or they'd like to be, what question do you ask them? And I, I ask them always the same question. Tell me about your religious background. Just tell me about, you know, I, I'm not asking, uh, do you believe, uh, in the creation in seven days. You know, I mean, those are important biblical doctrines, but that's not exactly what I want to know. I want to know your religious background. How did you become a Christian? Are you even a Christian? Because that's the starting point. Did you believe in Jesus? Did you repent of your sin? Were you baptized? And so on and so forth. So Paul does the same thing. He, you know, tell me about, you know, they're saying, yeah, we're with the Lord, we're, we're Christians. And Paul says, well, tell me about your religious background, basically. So part of the basic Christian gospel is that through Christ and His baptism, the Holy Spirit is received. Acts chapter two, verse 38. Peter says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So their answer shows what Apollos taught them was the message of John the Baptist. Because Paul asks them, have you received the Spirit? And so they say, well, we didn't even know there was a Spirit. So there's something, big hole in, in what they've been taught. And they've been taught John's message, John the Baptist. John's message was to repent and be baptized in preparation for the kingdom that was coming. This is what Apollo taught them. The message of the gospel is that the kingdom of God has come and it's come with power, and those who repent and are baptized in Jesus' name are forgiven and receive the Holy Spirit. And we don't put a lot of emphasis on the receive the Holy Spirit part. Usually when we quote Acts 2.38 or that section of scripture, we're always talking about 
making sure that baptism is by immersion, which it is, but you know, we, we focus on that. Or the forgiveness of sins. But do you realize that in the first century, the thing that really excited people about the gospel was not the idea of forgiveness of sins, it was the idea that they would receive the Spirit. Because the Spirit is what powers the resurrection. Romans 8 verse 9 to 11. To Jews the fact that the Holy Spirit was given through Christ was the big issue about the gospel. It's what they had been promised by the prophets. If you were a Jew and you look back at your history and the history of the promises made to you, the Spirit was given, but He was given very few times and to very few people. Some of the kings, some of the, ju the judges, Samuel, Samson, the prophets, you know, Isaiah, the Spirit was upon me. David, by the Spirit, defeated Goliath. You know, the Spirit came upon certain individuals for a time. Even David in one of the Psalms said, don't take your spirit from me. And the promise to the Jews was when the Messiah would come, the Spirit would be given to everybody, everybody, male, female, free, slave, everybody would get the Spirit and everybody would have the Spirit all the time. That was the exciting part of the promise. So Paul says to these people, did you receive the Spirit? And they said, well, we don't know what, the Spirit. We never even heard of the Spirit. So there obviously was a hole that big in what they had been taught. So this is what Paul teaches these men and what Aquila and Priscilla taught Apollos after they had heard him speak. You wonder, what did they teach him? Well, they taught him that repentance and baptism in Jesus' name brings forgiveness. Yes, so far, you know, a similar message to John and the gift of the Spirit, the regenerating power of the Spirit comes at that moment. Note that the disciples are rebaptized in Acts chapter 19. Um, it says, uh, let's see, and Paul said, verse four, it says, and Paul said, John baptized with baptism of repentance, telling people to live, to believe in him who was coming after him, that is Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. And there were in all about 12 men. So these men received not only the indwelling of the Spirit through baptism in Jesus' name, but also the empowerment of the Spirit through the laying on of hands of the Apostle Paul. So they were rebaptized. Why? Because they were baptized in the right way. John's baptism was by immersion, but they were baptized for the wrong reason. John's, John the Baptist's promise of the kingdom. So why, somebody says at this point, why, why weren't the apostles rebaptized? And the answer to that is that all those baptized by John the Baptist when he was preaching were not rebaptized when Christ's baptism was begun on Pentecost. And someone will say, well, why not? Because John's baptism up until Pentecost fulfilled all righteousness. Isn't that what Jesus said? So Apollos was one of these, as were the apostles. They had John's baptism at the time when John's baptism fulfilled all righteousness up to the cross. But once Peter preached at Pentecost, however, only Christ's baptism was valid. And anybody still receiving John's baptism needed to be rebaptized. And we have an example of this here in Acts chapter 19. In our doctrines class, you know, we always stress the idea you have to be baptized in the right way, by immersion, for the correct reason, 
And there are many reasons in the Bible for forgiveness of sins, to receive the Holy Spirit, uh, to become a member of the church, to put on Christ. You know, there are all kinds of metaphors that are used that talk about salvation. One of the problems that we have sometimes is that we talk about salvation in only one, one term. We only use one metaphor, one idea to talk about salvation. But the Bible, the New Testament, talks about salvation using many ideas. Let me ask you this, someone who's born again, is that person saved? Yes or no? Yes, raise your hand, yes. Someone who's born again is saved, of course. Can an unsaved person be born again? Well, no. That term, born again, it, in John 3, does he mention there anywhere forgiveness of sins? Member of the church? No. He uses the imagery of being born again to refer to salvation. All right. Um, um, uh, let's use Acts. Uh, those, uh, who are, uh, those who repent and are baptized in the name of Jesus receive forgiveness of sins. Would you say that someone who has been forgiven of their sins, would you say that that person is saved? Oh well, yeah, sure. Do you notice that in Acts 2, the author does not mention the idea of born again? You go to Galatians 3 and he says, all those who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Oh, other imagery, the putting on of Christ. Would you say that someone who has put on Christ is saved? Well, the Bible says so, but in Galatians 3, the author doesn't mention forgiveness of sins. The author doesn't mention born again. He, 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 he refers to the idea of salvation using the image putting on Christ. In Romans 6, 3, Paul talks about those who are buried uh, you know, with Christ in baptism are raised again. Would you say that someone who has been buried with Christ and resurrected through baptism, would you say that that person is saved? Yeah. But in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, he doesn't mention forgiveness of sins. He doesn't mention, do you get the point I'm making here? The Bible talks about salvation using a variety of images. And we tend to only use one image, forgiveness of sins. Well, that's true, but there are many other. Anybody who comes up to me and says, well, I was born again in the water and the spirit. That person is my brother. That person was baptized in the name of Jesus. He's just using a different imagery, biblical imagery, to describe his salvation. Would you say that someone who obeys the gospel is saved? Come on, commit. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Mark 16, 16. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved. That's obedience. If someone says, well, I obeyed the gospel, is that person saved? Yes. In Mark 16, does he mention at all forgiveness of sin, new life, putting on Christ? He doesn't mention those images. He just says those who obey Christ, those who are believe and are baptized will be saved. Those who obey the gospel, they're the ones who are saved. So I'm getting across the idea that if you became a Christian, if you use a certain imagery that the Bible uses to describe your salvation, then you've, you've been baptized for the right reason. If you say to me, I was baptized, excuse me, I was saved because I obeyed the gospel. Amen, you're saved. If you come up to me and says, well, I was, you know, I'm saved because I have the, 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 the new life. I was born again in the water and the spirit. That's right, John 3, you're, that, you're one of us. If someone says, um, oh, if someone says, I appeal to God for a clear conscience in baptism. First Peter, is that person saved? Absolutely, why? Because he is being baptized for a biblical reason. Now, the opposite is true as well. If the person says, well, <clears throat> I was baptized because it was my birthday. 
uh, I, I, I'm saved because uh, I came forward and I was baptized because my big brother came. No. Uh, I wanted to take communion. I was always embarrassed. Everybody, every time the plate came to me, I had to skip over and pass the bread to the guy next to me. So I wanted to be able to take the communion. No. That's what I mean. If you're baptized, immersed, because that's baptism, that's biblical baptism. If you're immersed for the right reason, and there are many, I obeyed the gospel, I was born again, I, you know, I put on Christ, you know, all those different metaphors, all those different images, then you've been baptized in the correct way for a biblical reason. But if you're not baptized, in other words, I'm sprinkled as a baby, I'm, you know, whatever, well then you, you have not been baptized the correct way. And Acts 19 is a tremendous help to us because it gives us a historical example of individuals who were sincere, absolutely sincere, who desired to know Christ, who desired to be and, and want Christ, except and they were even baptized the correct way, by immersion, but for the incorrect reason. And so Paul, you know, 12 people, Paul could have said, you know what, close enough, close enough. Close enough is good in what, horseshoes I think, but not in the, the, the doctrine of salvation. So here we see the baptism of these 12 men this is the beginning of the church at Ephesus. And one of the lessons we learned from the beginning of this church is you need to be baptized the right way for the right reason to become a Christian. Okay, next week we're going to continue and hopefully get actually into the text itself.